You know, every time I watch Doctor Who in the modern era, as I get older, I keep thinking, hang on, this was an episode that had things set in the future. We're now past that future. This is weird. Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. My name's Kevin, I'm a geek. You're watching Kevin the Geek. Welcome back to my weekly New Who Doctor Who review. Uh, apologies last week that I had to move it from the usual Wednesday slot to the Thursday. And I basically started a new job recently and I'm on a sort of four on, four off pattern and I just simply ran out of time to be able to record that episode in time to then be able to edit it for the release on on the wednesday because when i do these four on four off i'm on a 12 hour shift from seven till seven so very 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 long days for me so uh apologies for that uh but we're back with our normal uh wednesday attire but actually tomorrow is also going to be a doctor who day and for those of you who missed the end of the review last week basically tomorrow i'm playing a doctor who video game and it is the Doctor Who Adventure Games, which was basically released for free on the BBC website at the time that the fifth series actually got aired. And so it is something that I couldn't play back in the day because my computer was utter crap, to be perfectly honest with you. And I managed to find a way to download it and it plays. And so tomorrow on the channel, I'm going to play the very first episode, which is City of the Daleks. So make sure you stay tuned for that one. But speaking of the Daleks, this is now the second episode of this series where we have a very radical redesign of a classic villain. Because of course today we are reviewing The Hungry Earth and Cold War. And this is basically the episode which uh, introduces for, well, for me mostly, as well as you know, a lot of newer audience members, to the race of creatures known as the Silurians or Egnodines or whatever that term was that they called, or as they most commonly used in this episode, Homo reptilia. And I'll say I spoke when I did my reaction to, uh, sorry, my, my review of the episode uh, Victory of the Daleks that there's a lot of people that weren't necessarily big fans of the very radical redesign of the Daleks in that episode. But in this one, I don't think I've really heard that many people that have complained about this redesign of the Silurians. Because if you look at the Silurians from the episodes back in, you know, the sort of the 70s and the 80s, which admittedly I haven't seen any of them. So the, you know, the stories in Modern Who which address the Silurians, that is relatively speaking my only kind of experience with them uh, and i will probably call them the silurians rather than the homo reptilia um I, th I think colloquially the the name silurians is the one that sticks for for most people with doctor who um but their design in this one i liked it it was it enabled them to feel that they are more Earthlians, as the Doctor Put says, than had we had the ones in the in the seventies. And granted, again, I've only seen images of them, but they're big and bulky. And to be honest, they're they're closer in looks to what you have as the Sea Devils. And just very briefly speaking of the Sea Devils, they of course featured in their own episode in the Jodie Whittaker era, which at the time of this specific episode had aired. Of course, that was way, way, way off in the future. I find it interesting that they never chose to redesign the Sea Devils and they kept them very much like their you know, original kind of counterpart in the classic era, whereas here they decide to go with a very radical redesign. And I would say that of the 
of the villains that we have had that were classic villains and have been brought back in the modern era, there hasn't really been that many that have had a very radical redesign. You know, the Daleks, taking aside the new paradigm Daleks, they've been very consistent with their looks and they're very similar, maybe slight different uh, colour palette to some of the uh, classic era versions of the Daleks. Um, which actually, just, just while I'm briefly on that subject, um, do stay tuned on the channel because later on this month I'm actually going to be reacting to the very first ever serial uh, featuring the Daleks because I did, back in November, I did my re my reactions to Anna and Earthly Child and now going to go on to the second serial featuring the first Doctor which was, of course, the Daleks. So stay tuned later on this month for that. But... Yeah, the Daleks didn't necessarily really have a major, you know, kind of overhaul with it. Um, the Cybermen, in a way, they kind of did, but it was just more to make them slightly more contemporary. Similarly to the Suntarans in the fourth series. Um, I mean, obviously, bring about the Master. He's always going to look different if you're going to bring in a different actor, so you can't really talk about that. Um, and also maybe if you include the, the Time Lords from the, um, you know, from the End of Time episode where you brought back Rassilon and you brought back other Time Lords, they were just more of a modern telling of their original uh, kind of looks and, and appearances. But yeah, there's, they feel like they want to go on a big overhaul of the series. We've had a big overhaul of the logo, of the title sequence, of the theme tune, of the TARDIS interior, the sonic screwdriver, the Daleks, now the Silurians. Is there anything else they're not going to massively overhaul in, in this series? Realistically, no, there isn't. Um, but I did like the design. I really, really did. I, I thought it, it was... Um, it, it was smooth and, and um, kind of... Earth-like enough to make it feel that they were genuinely a Earth-bound species, more so than being a alien invadery kind of uh, villains. Now the actual characters of the Silurians, um, they did enough for what they needed to do. I won't say that I was particularly fond of Alea or Restak, who of course were both played by Neve McIntosh. But I, I guess is that more to do with my own personal um, views on how war-like characters or war-happy characters or war-longing characters are often portrayed in media? I think that may may do so. Because I didn't feel that there was a great deal of substance to them. It was very much, ah, oh, these stinking apes, we want to kill them. We want to claim back our planet and let's just kill them all. Bop, 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 bop. That was kind of it. There was no depth to them. You know, you had more depth to the leader, uh, Elgin, Elgar, Elden, I don't know. I can't remember what his name was. Um, and you had, in a way, more depth to the actual uh, Doctor Silurian, uh, Ma Malaketh, Malaketh, again, something like that. Some of these names I, I have really, you know, trouble remembering in this um, in this episode. But for the balance of the story, I think you didn't maybe want too much of the depth with that. But for me, it just felt a little bit clunky. For me personally, you may personally disagree. These are just my personal viewpoints. Don't be afraid to say that you disagree in the comments. You can absolutely have yours without going into a bitch fest, of course. You know, we, we all ha like to have a little debate on this channel. And uh, now the Doctor has um, just every episode is just getting better and better and better. Uh, and it, it's just so difficult to, to keep up with him. You know, the range of emotions that he showed in this story was absolutely splendid. Um, Amy and Rory also did incredibly well in this, and their dynamic is, is you know, just improving day on day. Um, which, of course, made it all the more heartbreaking at the end, when Rory gets killed and then ultimately erased from history. Sorry, spoilers, if you haven't seen this, but hey, this episode aired 14 or so years ago, so, yeah. You should have seen it by now, if, if you're watching this review, to be perfectly honest with you. Um, but, um, yeah. 
I think the biggest thing that I remember always thinking with this series, series five in general, and actually maybe, actually no, to be honest, I was maybe go down the, on a limb and say the majority of Stephen Moffat's era, he has a lot of episodes that I will go back to to watch big moments and certain moments. But I don't often go back to see the entirety of the episodes. And I'm I'm finding that like when I did this rewatch, I was like, oh yeah, I completely and utterly forgot about this thing that happened in this episode or that thing. Because, you know, it'll be the certain things that will stick with me. Mostly in this episode, it is literally the ending. And is that a bit unfair? Or is that the reality of the Moffat area? He he had a lot of big moments, but not a lot of great stuff in the in-betweens. I'm still on the fence about that one. Because I do think a lot of the, be the episodes that I've rewatched so far for Series 5 are definitely better than I remember. And I'll probably see more of that from Series 6 onwards. Because Series 5, I will still say I watched pretty damn, um, you know, repeatedly. Series 6, the main kind of ones involving the Impossible Astronaut kind of storyline, I have probably watched to death over the years. But all the in-betweening ones, not so much. So we'll, we'll see what happens when, when, I, when I go to start doing those reviews. It'll be interesting what I pick up and, and what I've missed you know, from not necessarily watching certain episodes over the years. But coming back to this, I think the supporting cast wasn't the greatest. I mean, Nazreen actually really surprised me on this rewatch and how, how little I remembered of her, but the same feelings came flooding back that she is a great character, has a lot of energy and exuberance and enthusiasm to the point that I would probably would like to have her back as an actual companion definitely more so than some of the companions we've had over the years she was absolutely brilliant and her dynamic with the doctor in particular was just beautiful to watch it was fantastic I didn't necessarily like the character of Tony too much because I thought it was quite bland and I feel that it was a bit of a waste for the actor whose name I can't remember but what I do remember him being in was an episode of Torchwood. Um, it was the one where they had to go to Flat Home Island. I can't remember the name of the episode and I do apologise for that. Uh, but Gwen goes over to the island and she sees this little boy who got taken by the rift and then he got dumped back as basically an older 40 year old man having seen some of the horrors and tragedies of the universe and and he has just this most heartbreaking scenes between him and his technically now younger mother um you know played by Ruth Jones and that was you know and a wonderful performance in that but just in this one I just felt that the material probably given to him didn't lend him it to himself for giving like the most amazing performance. Um, the dad and the kid, you know, Moe and Elliot, they were fine. There, there wasn't a lot of substance to them. I mean, Elliot was a bit of an idiot. You know, when you're leaving a fortified church, when aliens are literally a minute away to go and get headphones. I mean, I, surely that kid's got to be autistic. If he if he needs his his headphones like that, Cause, you know, to have such blinkered sort of tunnel vision that that's the most important thing at that specific moment in time, yeah, it's got to be autistic in my personal opinion there. But then the mum, Ambrose, hmm, I don't like her as a character. But my question would be, was that the intention of what Chris Chibnall was going for when he wrote this episode? Was that the intention of the actress when she was playing this character? Was it the intention of the director? I kind of feel yes. Which, if it was, means that she did a bloody good job in her role. Because the whole 
plot and story of this was how similar, yet at the same time, how different we are. And, you know, the Doctor's impassionate pleas to say, you know, be the best of humanity. And, and you know, he's saying to her, I don't do weapons. Just please don't do weapons. Put them away. That probably shows the biggest naivety on the Doctor's part. Not being able to spot dangerous people. Because at the end of the day, at this, at that specific moment, obviously Mo had been taken. Had it been... Well, yeah, you see it afterwards, after Ellie gets taken, he becomes a lot firmer, a lot more direct. Sometimes I think he just needs to see the bigger picture and actually say, no, you are coming down down to the earth with me. You are not being left alone with Alea, because I don't trust you. Because I didn't trust her from the moment, the moment that Alea said, I know which one of you will kill me. Do you? I knew there and then it was going to be her. It wasn't going to be Tony. It wasn't going to be Rory, for God's sake. So that only left Ambrose. But yeah, I think that this is an episode that does a lot of stuff decently. I won't say that there was a huge ton of stuff that was stupendously exceeding expectations but it did well. The sets were great. The design of, of the Silurians was great. And yeah, there, there was some decent moments across the board. Is it a top tier episode? Maybe, maybe not. I would have to see. Because I now have to score this episode. And if you're new to my videos, the way I score my Doctor Who videos is I give 10 categories, a score out of 10. Give an overall score out of 100, which then gives me a grade. And I use this when I rank episodes and stories and villains and things like that. So let's check out the scores for The Hungry Earth and Cold War. So this two-part story has scored 73 marks out of 100, which gives it a B grade. Like I said, it's decent. It's not amazing. It's not bog standard. It's not crap. It's decent. And the only criticism, like th there was this whole narration thing in this episode, which I didn't find... It was in the second part. It was just a bit of a weirdly placed one. I would have liked to have seen, like, almost like a teaser at the, at the end. And it would have helped with the narration. It would have tied it all together. Like, you've gone then a thousand years in the future. And you're seeing now the world inhabited with the humans and the Silurians. And, and this is Eldak. And he's, you know, telling this story to these human and Silurian children about how peace was brokered. That, I think, would have been a great way to neatly tie it together. But without it, the narration stuff just felt weird. Sorry, that's my last nitpick of this episode. So thank you so much for joining me to this point. Don't forget to join me tomorrow for when I do my uh, playthrough of the Doctor Who Adventure Games. Uh, the, the very first episode, City of the Daleks. Stay tuned for that. And of course, I've got loads of other Doctor Who content. Like I said, later on this month, I'm doing uh, the, my reaction to all seven episodes of The Dalek. So, you know, the very first serial featuring The Daleks in the first Doctor's era, all the way back in 1963 slash 1964, I think, by that point as well. So, yeah, loads of stuff to check out on the channel. So thank you once again for joining me. For now, my name is Kevin. I am a geek. And you've been watching Kevin the Geek. Goodbye.